You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry. We've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again for TWIFO. This week in Futures Options, the program where the name pretty much says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is over there at cmegroup.com. What's going to make it onto the show this week? I guess you have to tune in every week to find out. Is it going to be ags? Is it going to be equities, rates, metals, energy, crypto? You never know. You Got to tune in to TWIFO every week. My name, of course, Mark Longo. From theoptionsinsider.com, as well as from the ever exciting, at least we tend to think so around these parts, Options Insider Radio Network. Remember, nearly a dozen programs coming at you on the network side, on the on demand side for your listening pleasure. You want to go above and beyond, you want even more in your life. And who can blame you in these difficult, these troubled times? (laughs) Then head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. That'll get you access to nearly 200 plus hours exclusive content. That's a lot of content. You better be prepared, listeners, when you hit that button there. A lot of content. You can binge for nearly 10 days straight without eating, sleeping, taking a bathroom break of all that pro content. Of course, you get live access to everything else we do. And, of course, uh, fun giveaways like our pro trading crate. The Options Insider is the place to go as we go to look and see who's joining us in the CME Group hot seat this week on the program. And I'm pleased to welcome back. He hasn't been on in quite some time. Uh, Mr. Scott Bauer, the Chief Executive Officer over there at Prosper Trading Academy. Scott, welcome back to This Week in Futures Options. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes it, it has been a minute. Yeah. <laughs> My producers tell me it has. we have not chatted since November 5th of 2020. My goodness, a lot has happened since then, Scott. <laughs> a wee bit. Sure. Just, just a wee bit has changed in the world and indeed in the markets. Uh, so let's start there. Obviously, a lot of new listeners to the network and indeed to this program since your last appearance. Uh, so let's start there. Give our listeners a quick overview of your background in the options and financial space, as well as what it is you folks do over there at Prosper Trading Academy. Absolutely. So we, we keep people in markets. They're out. 
uh, in options, stock, and we are with them, the educators, myself, and a few other former traders that have, you know, com- we have a combined about 100 years of experience trading. And we literally hold our students' hands. And we have everybody from beginners to, you know, very advanced traders. And we are actively trading in the markets with them and most importantly, teaching them and giving them the education of the whys, the hows, the wheres, um, you know, how to take advantage of, of cheap volatility, expensive volatility, the different types of strategies you may want to move, you may want to use. And we're, like I said, we're live 8.30 to 3 o'clock Central Time every single day with our students. We're we're in here pretty much the full day. You know, a lot. You know, some places you'll you'll you know you'll get in and and you find the mentor, the guru, whatever is there for you know half an hour, an hour of the day. We're we're here. Eight, you know, bell to bell. We are here bell to bell. So that's pretty unusual in this space, and uh, we love it. I mean, we you know my my passion obviously has always been trading, but on the side uh, I'm a teacher as well, and and I love teaching. So. You know, I get to I get to get up every day and, you know, thank the lucky stars that I get to do exactly what I want to do. And our other educators are really in the same place. All right, then let's get the ball rolling, listeners. It is time for the Movers and Shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show we break down everything, lighting it up to the light side, a.k.a. the upside, and to the dark side over there at CME Group this week. You want to see this report for yourselves, like follow us on Twitter at Options, follow CME over there on Twitter. It's one of the few premium reports you can get access to from Bantix. You want to see the rest, and you listen into this show, I think you might want to. We really only scratch the surface of all the data they have to offer. Check them out, Bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com. It's the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires on all the data we don't have time to get to on the show this week. All right, Scott, let's dive right on into it. Where should we begin our journey this week, sir, to the light side or to the dark side? Well, it's got to be to the light side and and maybe looking at one of the more hated rallies ever that I've experienced <laughs> yeah. in yeah. 30 plus. Not a lot uh, of love. Not a lot of love for this rally. All right. To the light side, we go, listeners. Number five, we have soybeans. So starting off in the ags this week, listeners, soybeans are looking pretty robust this week, up nearly seven and a half percent to kick things off. By the way, listeners, we are uh, pretty heavily biased towards the green this week, another biased week. I'd say we're roughly 75, 25 or so green versus red out there. So a lot of green on the screen, which really shouldn't surprise anyone if you've been paying attention to the markets this week. Number four, we're staying in the ags, but we're shifting gear to livestock. In particular, lean hogs. We were just talking with Carly Garner a few weeks ago about a, just the fascination, what's going on out there, and the amount of paper we're seeing, actually, which is surprising in the livestock. Well, we've seen it again this week. Number four, it's lean hogs, up nearly 10%, 9.95%. So rocking couple of weeks for lean hogs. Number three, we're moving on out to energy, one of our three frequent offenders. Let's see if we can get all three on the show this week. Uh, number three, it is nat gas, up 10.33%. It was number three in the same direction last week, up 8.06%. So, banger couple of weeks for Nat Gas. Uh, number two, back to the ags, listeners, it is soybean oil, up 11.09%. And number one, we're staying in the ags, our big mover this week to the light side, oats, up 13.3%. Before you get all excited, yeah, oats not really a big options product. So, probably not going to be sinking our teeth out there. Probably three contracts on the tape as we're recording this, uh, but we shall see. Now, to the dark side we go, listeners. And again, we are mostly biased towards the green this week, so not a ton of red on the screen. Such as it is, number five, we have silver off one, almost one and three quarters percent coming in at the number five spot. So starting off in the metals to the dark side, number four, back to the ags, in particular, livestock again. Number four, we have feeder cattle off 1.81%. Number three, back to the metals, it is platinum off two, pretty much exactly 2%. Number two, we're back to the energy listeners. It is our Bob off pretty much 3%. It was a number three in the other direction last week, up seven and three quarters percent. So giving back some of those gains from last week. And number one to the dark side this week, listeners, we have another one of our frequent offenders. It is Bitcoin off 6.29%. 
Uh, it was number five in the same direction last week, off one and a half percent. So, again, you've seen a lot of the headlines, what's going on out there in the crypto space. No surprise, Bitcoin having a rough couple of weeks. All right, Scott, we've got a lot of things lighting up our movers and shakers this week. So maybe you want to start in one of those, or perhaps there's another complex that is drawing your eye this week. Where should we begin our journey this week, sir? Well, let, let's start at your very bottom, which would be Bitcoin. All right, to the world of crypto. We go, listeners. It's time to explore the volatile world of Bitcoin, Ether, and more. It's time to talk about crypto. All right, everyone. Welcome to the wonderful, sometimes fascinating, sometimes frustrating world of all things crypto, in particular Bitcoin. Uh, you guys and gals know where to go to find these reports for yourselves. See me group.com. Slash Twifo. And once you're there, you're going to go into that asset class drop down. It's an alpha order list. So just go down one slot from AGS into cryptocurrencies. And then we'll kick things off hanging out in the big products. We're going to go into indexes and then Bitcoin, where we will begin our journey from there. As we're kicking off the show here today, listeners, we're seeing Bitcoin still looking pretty rough. 25,000 handle, 25,165 in those front futures. So threatening. To break the 25,000 level in the wrong direction off 1,310 handles or nearly 5% uh, just since Monday. Of course, you extend that back to the end of our show last week off about six and a third percent. So rough couple of weeks, you know, SEC enforcement actions, they tend to do that. They tend to shake up a market out there. Uh, so Scott, we'll start there. First off, I'm curious for you guys over there at Prosper. How big is crypto? Are you getting a lot of your clients out there who are coming to you asking about crypto? We get, you know, not quite as much as it was, you know, a year ago, 18 months ago, but a lot of our clients asking about it. And, you know, is it something we should be in? How do we trade it? Uh, not just Bitcoin, but some of the altcoins as well. Uh, so, yeah, we, we have a fair share of, uh, of our clients that are trading it. And would you say you primarily look at the listed stuff on CME? You're hanging out in the spot? Are you, are you slinging Bitto? What's your preferred vector out there? Yeah, it, it, it's the CME products. And then, you know, many of the coins, the more liquid coins on, on a Coinbase, let's say, um, where people have a lot of um, liquidity, a lot of access to it. Uh, we, don't, we don't really go into any of those coins that are, you know, scarce or that are going to be, let's call the meme coins, that, that's not our game. No Shiba for you guys over there at, uh, at Prosper? <laughs> I can't say we don't talk about it, but, but it's definitely not at the, uh, at the front of our list. All right, so Scott, you wanted to start in crypto. What's catching your eye out here in Bitcoin this week? Sir? Yeah, so you know, we saw that massive consolidation over, it seemed like, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks, right around 27000 and that was in the face of, as you mentioned, all of the regulatory, you know, hurdles and headwinds that have been coming at the space. And then all it took was Powell yesterday to sound a little hawkish to talk about, you know, uh, dollar policy, if you will, for Bitcoin to look at that and say, ah, you know what, this isn't so good. So this sell off here down to, well, I know we're up above 25 right now, but just under 24, um, you can look back and say, well, when Bitcoin foils, when it consolidates as it did for a while, that's usually an anticipation of a large move one way or the other. So this move is not unexpected. Whether it was up or down, this, this size of move in such a very short time is not unexpected. But where do we go from here? And I, I will tell you that so far, so far, this level right around 25, and not, not because it's a big round number, which people like, but 24, 9, 25 area, th there's some support there. There, There is really some support there. So if it can hold there, I really think there's a chance we get back to that 27 number very, very quickly. Now, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, you got to be looking for 23,300 ish as the next area. But I will say that overall, I mean, if you would have told me, you know, two, three, four months ago that given all of the news, all of the, the hurdles, um, Sam Bankman-Fried, you know, Binance, 
everything, all of the SEC issues, that Bitcoin would still be in the mid 20,000s, I would have said, you're nuts. So I actually think, and I know I'm probably in the minority here, I actually think this could be a buying opportunity. So you're surprised by some of the resilience. I think that makes some sense out here. You would maybe expect, given all those headlines, that maybe we would be We'd be back, maybe back testing the 16,000 level where we were not too long ago. Oh, there. Yeah, you know, right around 20,000 or so. I mean, I think this has been unbelievably resilient in the face of just negative news after negative news uh, coming at the space. And you mentioned a buying opportunity. You know, this is a, a, a refrain I think we're going to come back to throughout the show. But vol is, is pretty low. It's pretty low across a lot of asset classes out there. And Bitcoin, no exception. If you listen to our crypto rundown show, Every Monday, listeners, you know, you've been saying for a while we are at or maybe even exceeding 52 week lows in, in a lot of these crypto products, including Bitcoin. Uh, so I'm curious for you, Scott, does that make you maybe a little bit more attracted to the, the premium buying side? Is that how you're going to go in Bitcoin to scoop up some of these buying opportunities? Absolutely. And, and with premium levels so low, you know, if I want to establish a long position, I would not want to sell put. I would not want to sell a put spread because you're just not getting the bang for your buck there when premium is so low. So I would much rather buy to the upside. Um, you can also look, you know, I know, I know, you know, there, there's other proxies for Bitcoin out there. And you can look at some of the other stocks also that kind of have a very high beta, a very high correlation to Bitcoin. And if you didn't, you know, want to get in the token, you can certainly trade those stocks or, you know, the, the micro Bitcoin product at the CME is a fantastic product to get in at a, at a much reduced cost. And yes, the volatility is still extremely, extremely low. It's not where it was one, you know, a couple of weeks ago, but it's still, if you look historically here, we're, we're in the lower 15 to 20% of its historical, you know, volatility range. Yeah, you know, it's been it's been fascinating to watch out here. I was just looking at some of the numbers on the TWIFO report while you were talking, Scott. I was hoping, given all the external factors that work here in the crypto space, that we'd see a little bit more paper out there uh, on the big CME options this past week. And really not a ton ton of paper on the tape. We had 500 contracts last week and uh, 300 or so this week. So not a ton. Again, this is a big, beefy contract, listeners. This is, of course, the, the 5X a big contract. So if we expand that out to, to Scott's preferred vehicle, I know for a lot of you out there, the micro, they're doing a little bit more paper. But again, these are micro size. So once you adjust it for the size of the contract, still not a ton of paper, about a thousand contracts on the tape this week and a little over 2000 on the tape last week on the micro side, closing in on 3000 last week, a little bit more action out there this week. But I could certainly see why some of you my prefer the the micro still an issue for a lot of you out there trying to get into these the liquidity just isn't there so i could see why a lot of you are still diving into products like bitto the liquidity is there it can go into your securities account pretty easily so i could see why a lot of you are writing into it a bitto is your preferred vehicle even though as you said on the crypto rundown the adb and that product also continuing to go down it's dropped from about ninety thousand contracts a day down to about thirty thousand now not a ton of paper going up out there as well but of course it is summertime so we expect a little bit of a lull in all of these products. Let's break down really quickly what's going on. Let's go out to the micro Bitcoin just for some fun. Of that, about about 1,000 contracts this week. About exactly half of that is going up in uh, the contract expiring on the 19th, so in about four days. So not, not a ton out there. Again, uh, the vol, as we said before, pretty anemic. It's popped up a bit. It's about six points to the upside this week and at about a 43. So it's not quite in the 30s anymore, but it's still fairly anemic. We also saw a lot of the CME products really leaning to the dark side last week. Heavy bids to the puts throughout the term structure. 8% bid were the June puts, 8.2% were the June weekly puts, 7% for the contracts expiring in a few days. So a lot of bids to the puts. But now that we've moved down to close to the 25,000 strike, a lot of that bid has gone away, which does make sense. You're buying puts, you're moving down towards the strike, you're buying them in, you're going to take some of those off. So it makes sense we see some of that bid. I um, mean, if we go a little bit farther out, listen, let's say we go out to Dece, then like we're seeing in a lot of the other products out there, uh, that bid to the puts is gone. And now we're starting to see flat skew or maybe bid to both wings. And on the micro side in Bitcoin, we're seeing about a 4% bid to the puts and about almost about five and a half percent bid to the calls in December. So it's kind of a coin flip, which way crypto will go after that. Since we're talking about crypto, let's look really quickly. Let's pop in on ETH. ETH usually 
a little bit more active, a little bit more volume. And that was the case uh, this week on the micro side, a little over 3,000, about 3,200 of the micro ether contracts going up. Ether, when we're kicking off the show here, listeners, 16 and a half, pretty much exactly off 185 handles or a little over 10% just since Monday. So ether falling out of bed this week as well. Of that volume, about 28% going up in the SEP contract. So we'll look there really quickly. Uh, the vol out there, about a 44 and a third, up about four points, but still very low. If you, if you know anything about Ether, you know it's structurally more volatile than Bitcoin. So you don't expect it to be trading at or even below the level that Bitcoin is trading at. So when they're, when they're hovering at the same level, it might be some interesting vol spreading opportunities. In terms of skew, uh, the puts right now are pretty bid in September. Uh, the calls are kind of flat, which is kind of interesting. We're seeing that uh, on our crypto rundown program as well. The bid is starting to get a little bit into the put wing, not terribly dramatically, but it's starting to pick up there a little bit. And the most active contract out here this week was the uh, the 2000 call in December going up about 360. Actually, it might have been a roll. It's like the SEP and the DC 2000s both traded 360 times. So maybe a calendar or a roll going up out there. Scott, when you guys aren't talking about Bitcoin, are you guys looking at Ether at all over there at Prosper? We are. It's it's not quite as uh, quite as in our faces in the news as Bitcoin, but we, we absolutely do. But you know, looking at CME, not just option volume has been really really reduced. If you look at overall futures volume too, you, even today. So on a move like this that we're seeing in Bitcoin today, the, the big contract at CME has only about nine thousand contracts traded total, and the micro is about 5,000. I mean, that's, that's pretty low volume. I mean, I think it just goes to show you that, um, you know, there, there may be a lot of people on the sidelines with this. All right, listeners. As Scott mentioned earlier in the show, this is one of the more hated rallies in the history of time. And I know a lot of you, speaking of hating, a lot of you hate crypto. You love yourself some equities. So maybe we'll head out there next. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody. Welcome to the ever head-scratching, ever-perplexing world of equities. You know where to go to find these reports. Pop on out of crypto. Go down two slots on the TWIFO report to equity indexes. Then in the product family, you're going to select U.S. Index Mini, of course. I'm going to hang out in the S&P 500, where we go from there, as anyone's guess. Scott, I know you're not talking crypto. You probably spend the lion's share of your time over there at Prosper talking about equities. You know, we haven't chatted with you since the end of 2020. So as I mentioned, a lot has changed since then, including for the equity space, the rise of all things zero day. It has just taken over the equity complex. It seems like all of the action is in the front couple of days, and that's really it. Nobody cares about weeks or months away anymore. So, so let's start there. I'm curious for you, Scott. Where do you fall on this whole zero day phenomenon? Are you a fan? Are you not a fan? What's your take on? This? Okay, so so let me separate. Let me put on two different hats here. Okay, yes, volume has picked up considerably. About forty percent of all SPX volume are zero DTEs. As a professional, and I'll call myself a professional only because I've been in the business for over thirty years, <laughs> but as a professional, I think zero DTE are great. For the casual retail trader out there, I think it presents some issues. And I think people um, that are just casually trading, looking to capture you know, a ton of premium in a very, very short time, or on the flip side, looking for one of those you know, one-off moves, I think you get into trouble. To use them professionally as a hedge against a different part of portfolio, use them to create some calendar spreads, some time spreads, I think it is a fantastic, fantastic product. Anybody that's just a casual trader out there, though, I I think what you really need to do is learn more about it and learn more about the Greek of how the theta works, how that premium decay works. Because that's just going to change literally in the blink of an eye. And that's where people that I have met, that I work with on a daily basis trading these, that's where they get into trouble. They don't realize, literally, they don't realize that if you you own a, a zero DTE, put or call, that come 
you know, noonish, maybe even 11 o'clock noonish, all of a sudden you start seeing whack, that theta, that, that premium burn just hits you over the head. And a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, we were talking about that just on our previous show earlier today, about just yesterday and earlier this week going into the Fed announcements. That's that zero day strata went from thirty dollars and collapsed to pretty much nothing in the span of a of a few hours there. So someone got left holding the bag on that. Certainly is intriguing. Obviously poses a lot of challenges out there as well. Which again, we always caution you listeners. They're intriguing products, but to definitely know what you're getting into with those. And of course, they're not set in and forget it trades. You're going to have to be on it. Uh, outside of that, Scott. Outside of all things zero day, you mentioned at the top of the show. This is one of the more hated rallies. I definitely agree with you there. A lot of people not loving this. A lot of people sitting in cash, even in our audience, was is a very options savvy audience. We did a poll a few weeks ago. We said, hey, are you in on this market? Are you pretty much in cash and looking for opportunities? And the majority said they were in cash. I was surprised. So a lot of people on the sidelines hating this rally. Uh, what are your thoughts on what we're seeing? Yet another leg up today, Scott. Uh, it, it defy, to me, it, de- it defies being rational. But as the old saying goes, market can be a heck of a lot more rational for a lot longer or irrational, I should say, for a lot longer than my bank account or my trading account can can handle it. So you do have to follow order flow. You, it, It's been very difficult to have an opinion in this market because even my opinion, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, again, doing this for a long time, my opinion has to been has been to stay in some equities that you like or stay in, you know, the S and P's or whatever ETFs, but at the same time, buy that cheap premium, buy that cheap vol. And I started doing that when the VIX was nineteen twenty, thinking, Oh man, you know, this is this is fantastic. This is a great dude. Vol's not going any lower than this, right? And here we are with the VIX sitting at thirteen fourteen and So that hedge, if you will, of buying that cheap premium, you know, lost on that side. Certainly you can make on the other side because you've seen the appreciation in the market. But it it has been it has been real tough. But you know what? I would still tell people right now that, you know, if you've been in this market, if you, you know, want to stay in this market because you believe it's going higher, great. But you've got to buy, you've got to buy cheap insurance. Right. Anybody that that is going to get insurance and they're going to shop around for their auto insurance, homeowners insurance, whatever it may be, you want to get it when it's on sale or, you know, when when the you know what, not hitting the right when there's not a fire out there. Well, now's the time to do it. Lock in some of that just by being by buying some cheap premium, whether whether it's buying upside calls in the VIX, maybe or downside puts in the S&P, Q's, whatever it is. Someone that doesn't do that, uh, you know, to me, that, that that's just not the right thing to do. But who am I to say, you know, who am I to tell anybody else how to spend their money? But as a trader, not an investor, as a trader, that's exactly what I'm doing. Take advantage of some of those uh, lower vol levels, kissing 13 handle in VIX not too long ago and threatening it again coming into Showtime, listen. Well, I get my VIX June 15 puts off at my preferred level. I guess only time will tell. Let's get out here, see what's lighting it up out here in the mini this week, listeners. And a spoiler alert, it's Fed week. So a lot of paper in the tape. Over 4 million contracts on the tape in the mini S&P options right now. 4.1 million to be precise. So a whole heck of a lot of you slinging yourselves some e-mini S&P options. You don't need me to tell you the lion's share that is going up and expiring today or maybe tomorrow <laughs> at the latest. 20% of the paper this week is going out in the June contract that expires in about three quarters of a day. 15% is going out in about five minutes. <laughs> and another 11% expires in about a full day. Uh, so you're talking well over a third. You're talking almost half of this week's paper. You're talking, yeah, 46% of this week's explosion of volume all expires in the next pretty much day. So again, that just shows you how much the options landscape and the equities has been reshaped by this. Fascinating to watch. And the most active contract this week are the 4,400 calls, which again, we are north of that now, 44 and about a quarter. So another 
rally ho day here. Up about 122 handles in the e mini on the week. So since Monday, so nice, nice green on the screen for all of you bulls out there. If you are indeed loving this rally, and again, those calls that are going out tomorrow, 53, almost 54,000 of those trading this week with the lion's share going up today, 22,000. Again, not surprising. We just broke through the 44,000 strike earlier today. So makes some sense. We see folks piling into those uh, 10,000 yesterday, 12,000 on Tuesday, 9,300 on Monday. Seems like folks were closing, taking those off earlier in the week. And then as the rally kicked in, uh, they've been opening as a result. So more opening paper on the 4,400s as the week has progressed, which again, given this rally, makes a certain amount of sense out there. And then right behind that, listeners, we have the 36 half puts going out in a day. (laughs) So again, all sorts of paper all over the place, lighting it up this week, including looks like it might be might be some verticals going up out here. We have 20,000 of the 36 half puts going up yesterday as well as 20,000 of the 3520 puts. So 130 point vertical going up 20,000 times yesterday. It seems like it because it was opening on both legs. It seems like they might be bailing on it today though cuz 20,000 exactly going up again today. So put that spread up yesterday taking it off. I don't know. 36 half puts with a day to go. That wouldn't be my preferred option or my that vertical either, but looks like someone might have liked it. If that's the case, maybe our friends out there who have been blasting away at a bunch of premium in the E-mini, maybe they're deciding to start selling put spreads instead. That would be interesting. Maybe their risk manager tapped them on the shoulder. Stop picking up pennies in front of this steamroller. Either way, though, uh, still garbage puts also lighting it up out here. But let's get to some more relevant stuff, listeners. Let's go down a little bit more. Let's go out. Let's go out eight days, which is an eternity in the world of equities these days. Let's go all the way out to the 3,900 puts expiring in eight days because those are pretty active this week as well, including, not surprisingly, the last two days. They did nothing on Monday and Tuesday. It's pretty much a goose egg, both of those days. Then they lit it up the last couple of days, about 22,000 going up on Wednesday and almost 21,000 today. Closing yesterday, maybe closing again today. Of course, who knows? The OI is kind of not as is kind of small there, so it looks like it's probably opening paper. Opening on 3,900 puts. Interesting. We are, again, dancing in a precarious range, listeners, right north of uh, 4,400. So 3,900 puts opening with about a day to go. Or it shouldn't be eight days to go in this case. That would be an interesting turnaround if those were indeed uh, to become relevant. Let's, let's scan really quickly because it is mostly zero day. Like I said, about half the paper is going up and expiring in the next 24 hours. But we can find some stuff if we go a little bit farther out. For example, if we go out to the to the actual June contract, which expires in about 15 days, we saw 32,000 of the 4,300 puts going up. So that's an intriguing strike out there. 4,300 puts trading pretty actively, nearly 10,000 contracts a day all week long and opening all week long. So interesting opening on that. Are they overriding or maybe, as Scott was saying, time to load up on some cheap protection? Maybe some folks are loading up on all that fun. As well. Probably spend the whole show dialing into all these trades out here. There were four, four plus million contracts going up in the E-mini listeners. But those are, those are some of the big dogs out here that were lighting it up. Got anything else catching your eye out here in the equities complex you want to talk about this week or you want to move on to something else? Well, let, let, let me point something out here. There has been over the last several weeks, um, on, especially on some of the big tech stocks, approaching earnings, this massive, almost, almost to the point something I have never seen like this before, massive call skew, massive, massive call skew. You can see it again in Adobe. Adobe announces today after the close of the market. We've seen this in NVIDIA, saw it in AMD, you, you name it. These big, these big tech stocks have had just this incredible call skew. So for instance, Adobe right now is trading 494, okay? The expected move that the market is pricing in just to the end of the day tomorrow is about 37 or 38 bucks. Okay, and that's in either direction. So let's say you go out to a strike $40 away from where we are right here. So let's look at the 440, excuse me, the, the 450 puts. Okay. So the 450 puts are right now, and these expire tomorrow, are trading $2.60. That equivalent $40 upside call, which would be the 535, even if you go to the 540 call, trading double that. 
trading like $5.20. So there is just a massive, massive call skew right now, which at the end of the day tomorrow, that's going to come back into line. That is absolutely going to come back into line, but that just tells you where the bias has been and where the bias is coming into a lot of these earnings reports. Um, it has just been massively. I, again, I, I'm not sure that I have ever seen this big of a skew, especially to the call side. You think this is even outpacing what we saw back in the heady days of 2021, Scott? I do. I do. And in terms of skew, yes. Um, I, I can't ever remember it being this egregious. And there are ways, there are strategies to, to take advantage of this. Because what happens is, you know, many of your listeners know, and you know, what happens is implied volatility always reverts back to its mean. So after a big announcement, after earnings or a Fed announcement, whatever it may be, you're going to see that vol come back into line to where it typically trades. So I'm not saying that skew is going to come back all the way one to one tomorrow, but absolutely by early next week, we're going to see that come back into alignment. And there are ways to take advantage of that, but boy, oh boy, I mean, it, you know, for me right now, this, this would be called in option terminology, this would be called a conversion, meaning that if you wanted to put on this type of position where you are buying a put, selling a call, and buying stock as your head, that's called a conversion. And you're trying to lock in that massive, massive skew, that massive implied volatility difference. Um, as a floor trader, we would be doing these till the cows came home. A little bit more difficult doing it, you know, trading on the screens, but that is really the strategy out there um, that, you know, for me, you want to take advantage of. Stuff, listeners, are you out there sling in some Adobe? Hit us up, uh, let us know. I really quickly, I forgot to. Hit on the top of the segments here, a little bit of a quick vol rundown for equities. Can't talk equities without talking vol. As you said, VIX kind of anemic, kicking off the show, 14 and a quarter. That's still up from where it was this time last week, believe it or not, listeners. Up about two-thirds of a point. Uh, VIX, so the vol of vol at around 92, almost 93, up nearly five points from where it was this time last week. Vol Q, so the at-the-money vol of the NASDAQ at about 1840. It's up about one and a quarter points. That puts that VIX to vol Q, so that NASDAQ, to S and P 500 vol spread a little over four points. That's 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 wide for that spread out there. You know we talk vol Q a lot on our vol view show, listeners. Uh, that spread got pretty narrow for a while. So to see it back out four points, about two thirds of a point wider than it was this time last week. Uh, that is intriguing stuff out there. All right, looks like we got time for about one more complex here on the show, Scott. So where should we head next? Sir? Uh, you tell me, I'd, ra I'd rather not go into some of the ags as that is really not my, my sweet spot, but we can look at some of the currencies. So a deep wanna... dive into lean hogs is what you're looking for, sir. I think we can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> How about there's a lot of action. A lot of our listeners are really, uh, really all tied up in that gas. How about a little bit of energy? Yeah, sure. All right, um, listeners to the world of energy, we go. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, listeners, you can't get out of here without talking a little bit of the old nat gas. You know where to find this. Pop out of equity indices. Pop into energy. That's one slot above it. These alpha order lists. Nice and easy to navigate. Then in product family, scroll down three to nat gas. Then pop into the top product there to get your fix of nat gas for the week. Seems like a whole heck of a lot of you are slinging some nat gas. Usually this time of week, we expect to see it around 400, maybe a busy week, 450. Already 525,000 contracts on the tape in nat gas this week. So intriguing stuff. Uh, we've been saying for a while, when are we going to get this rally? When are we going to get this rally? A lot of our guests recently have been speculating about some upside. We had Carly talking about buying some SEP 3s on the show a couple of weeks ago. Those are looking pretty decent right now. With Nat Gas, that front future hanging out at about 255, up nearly 30 cents or about 13% just since Monday. Listeners, of course, you go back to the end of our show last week, up about 10 and a third percent. Uh, still hanging out right around that two and a half level, which is where we've rallied to in the past. Then it seems like the rally has kind of uh, petered out. Will this week be any different? I guess we'll find out. 
Uh, Scott, I'm curious for you. Nat Gas is one of our frequent offenders on the show. It's certainly one of the more volatile products we talk about here on Twifo every week. Is this one that's really become attractive to a lot of your uh, clients over there, or is it maybe the opposite? Is it too volatile? Is it too much action? It, it, it's not too volatile with the price down here, and and you know when you see it depressed down here, it's you know two and a half, whatever it is, and, and you look to see where it's come from, and that it's actually traded in this range. I'm looking here. Basically, since let's call it mid March, you know, to now, we have traded in such a tight range here that a lot of people have been looking for a breakout. And a lot of people were looking for big rebound when it was also, you know, when it was three and three and a half when, as it came down. But this consolidation that we've seen here, may, this might be the start of popping out here, right? We're, we're getting now with this increase this week and, and today. We're getting to the very top of its range, the same price that, you know, same level that it hit just about a month ago in in mid-May. That may give us a little bit of resistance, but if NatGas breaks through this area right here, technically, honestly, there's not a lot that we get up to almost a three buck level, which that would be a significant move. You're talking about almost 20% move from here. So I think that that, that is a very good opportunity, especially with vol continuing to be low. I think that is a really good opportunity. And again, this is this is not unlike other asset classes. When you look at the charts and you see this coiling, you see this consolidation for a while, that is typically the precursor to a bigger volatile move coming up. And you know, whether that move is up or down, you know, that that's that's the, the big conundrum. But I think that, you know, Nat Gas has put in just a, a major, major bottom here. And if it can get through the top of this channel here, I think you see that move up to three bucks. It has been fascinating to watch this. It's been, you know, two and a half and down threatening the two handle again. We've had a lot of guests come on and talking about the upside and how the, the trade is to the upside. And it, it seems like Nat Gas was poised uh, to move to the upside. And yet every week on the show, we were talking about the skew being bid to the puts. Tons of one and a half and one and three quarters puts going up every week. It seemed like we were in this this weird environment where everyone thought it should be going up, and yet all the options paper, all the flow was in the other direction. This week, of course, we're getting that rally. I guess it sounds like you're on that upside tip as well, Scott, that you think maybe maybe uh, this could be the move that could actually have some legs. Yeah, with with vol at these levels here, I think buying the upside calls is, is definitely the way to go. I, I, I really do. And, you know, again, to me, I'm a volatility trader. I want to take advantage of vol when it's cheap. I want to sell it when it's expensive. If vol was expensive here, I'd be selling puts. Vol is cheap. I'm buying the upside here. And is it a little speculation? Maybe. But again, if we get that breakout here, if we get any sort of information here, um, there, there's there's a big time kind of dead air space up to three bucks, and that's what I'm looking at. Let's get into that, listeners. Right now, I said over half a million contracts on the tape in Nat Gas. So a whole heck of a lot of you slinging some Nat Gas options this week. Got mentioned the Vol is is going to be one of the frothier, more volatile products we talk about here at CME this week. About a 66. Uh, by the way, of that, nearly about a, over half a million contracts. 38% of it going up in this July contract that has about 12 days to go. So we're going to hang out out there. The vol there is at about a 66, which may sound high when we're talking about VIX threatening 13 and all that stuff. That's up about five, nearly six points on the week. But also, if you know anything about Nat Gas, you've been listening to this show for a long time. Nat Gas can easily get into the triple digit. So a 66 vol is almost literally two thirds of where it was. Not too long ago from a ball perspective. So ball has kind of come in across the board. Nat gas, no exception. Getting a little bit of a back this week, but still from an overall vol level perspective, still nowhere near as expensive as it has been. So intriguing stuff out there. And again, 38% of that paper this week going up in that July contract. So we'll hang out out there. What's the skew looking like out there? Again, for a while there, it's kind of been looking bid to the puts. Then last week we saw a little bit of a bid sneaking into the calls. Maybe. Enough was enough. People were just tired of seeing it getting beat down. They wanted to get some upside. Maybe they're listening to the show. A lot of our guests have been talking about upside plays in that gas for the last month or so. Either way, the calls were bid last week, about 4.3% bid. So a slight bid to the calls, but a slight bid there. 
Uh, the puts about 2.3% cheap. Uh, this week, most of that has flattened out, which is interesting, even though the vol is up. Uh, we're seeing the puts about 1.6% bid. So the puts have swung slightly in the other direction. The calls have come down to flat, about 0.7% cheap. So not a huge bid in either direction. So again, kind of the options market telling us a bit of a coin flip as to where we're heading next. In terms of action, uh, we are seeing the two and a half calls leading the dance this week with about 21, almost 22,000 contracts. That is a refreshing change. I kind of got tired of coming on this show week after week and saying 50,000, one and a half puts are going up again this week and one and three quarters puts. Just to see a little bit of upside making its way into the list, that is just a nice change of pace out there. Again, 21, almost 22,000 of these calls. Uh, the big day for them was actually Tuesday. 10,000 and change on Tuesday, mostly opening there. 5,500 today, so a pretty active day today. 3,300 on Monday, 2,500 on Wednesday. It seems like opening earlier in the week and then closing in the latter half of the week, which again, that makes sense. We were rallying towards it. So folks were putting on some two half calls. Now that we've hit that strike and blown through it, maybe some people taking those off. Uh, right behind it, we did also see the three calls. So getting back up to the upside that uh, Scott was just talking about, the three calls. Going away in, yeah, these are, the, these are the AUG three calls. So going out in about 41 days, listen, doing 21,000 contracts as well. The big day for those today, those are exploding today. 12,500 of those going up today. Looks like all of that opening. 5,200 yesterday also opening. Uh, 2,000 on Monday, 1,300 on Tuesday. It's like opening pretty much every day. A lot of folks piling into the threes. Are you piling into the threes as well? A lot of our guests have been talking about the three strike for a while, listeners. A little bit farther out, I think by September, but August August could certainly fit that bill as well with this pretty aggressive rally we're seeing out here. Again, listeners, the question is, we've seen this dance before a couple of times now. Can we hold on to these levels? Are we going to get to two and a half then kind of just wither and die out there? Worth noting, it's not all calls all the time. There are puts going up this week as well. About 18,000 of the two puts, which expire in about 12 days, have gone up this week as well. Uh, the big day for those, Tuesday, 7,000 on Tuesday, 4,300 on Monday, 4,300 again today, about 2,000 yesterday. Looks like mostly opening with the exception of Tuesday, which again makes some sense, the level we've been threatening for quite some time. And not to be outdone, you are seeing <laughs> a whole slew of one puts <laughs> going up this week as well, including in October, about 12,000 on the one puts going up. Ah, one put. Talk about a strike and an option that just has no magic to it. I in the one put. <laughs> just nothing scintillating about that trade at all. Much rather talk about the three calls. But say la vie, that's where we find ourselves this week. All right, listeners. That music means we've come to the end of another intriguing journey through the world of all things futures, options. Scott, I want to thank you for joining us on the show this week. We'll have to get you back on uh, more frequently than once every uh, two and a half years or so. Well, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Let's do it again real soon. And before we go, Mr. Scott, I'd like to leave our audience wanting more. So maybe really quickly here at the end of the show, if there's a complex that's been on your radar, maybe we didn't get a chance to chat about it, you wanted to mention it really quickly, or maybe just some intriguing trades or ideas or things that you're noticing in the market right now that you want to leave our listeners with. Uh, now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Well, I, I would always tell everyone, buy when you can and not when you have to. So what that means is if you're looking to to not even just look for a move to the downside, but buy that protection, right? Buy that that risk in a little bit. You want to buy it when it's on sale because if we get a print or if we get a move one day that all of a sudden the S&P is down 2 3% or a continuation of that, you are going to see ball spike. Buy it when you can, not when you have to. There you go. Wise words, listeners. And Scott, if folks want more of those wise words, where should they go? What should they do? Yes. Academy, which is ProsperTrading.com. You can find us. Uh, we're here in Chicago. We are in the Board of Trade building, and we are very accessible. We help our students bell to bell. 
There you go. Check them out. Prosper Trading Academy, the place to go to learn more. You know where to go to learn more about all this data we're talking about on the show every week. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO. T-W-I-F-O is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires on just about every complex under the sun. Doesn't trade much. You want to go sink your teeth into oats or we didn't get to lean hogs and some of the ags this week. You want to go check those out. Maybe rates float your boat or FX, whatever it is. It's there for you, listeners. See me group.com slash twifle. And then, of course, if you want to go deeper, you want to check out even more reports and more data. Bantix.com. B-A-N-T-I-X.com is the place to go. Tell Nick we sent you. He'll be very happy to walk you through all the offerings over there. That's going to do it for us on the network today. Back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. Listeners, should be an intriguing one. Fed week, after all. A lot to unpack there on the vol front. And then after that, for all of you pro folks, we're coming back with options oddities, breaking down the mad week that was from an unusual activity perspective. You know, if you're listening to the option block, earlier today a lot of interesting traits going up this week so we'll have a lot to sink our teeth into tomorrow then of course we're off for the holiday on monday so no option block no crypto rundown next week and then we're back again with our usual slew of content all the way through to next thursday another episode of this week in futures options stay safe out there everybody you're listening to the options insider radio network the home of the options podcast for more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. <laughs>